Thank you for having me on. I think it's a wonderful cause that you have for this conference, and I'm really proud to be a part of the, the actually really amazing speaker lineup. Uh, so who am I? I am Magnus. I am uh, situated in Sweden, which is on the intro. Uh, I am a SQL Server consultant. I've been working with SQL Server as first a actually web developer focusing on uh, more and more on the database side. And then I ended up as a DBA, which is my kind of current occupation. I'm going to talk about PowerShell today uh, and especially about DBA tools. So what is DBA Tools? Well, DBA Tools is a PowerShell module, which is all free. Uh, it was created by Chris Lemaire uh, initially. But if you look at dbatools.io, which is the web page of DBA Tools, you will see just how many contributors you have to this open source project. And it's really amazing how, how many people are contributing by writing code, by helping out with testing and, and many, many things. And uh, today I would say that DBA Tools has anything that you can do with SQL Server Management Studio, you can do with DBA Tools. And why would you want to do that? Well, it's a bit easier to automate scripting of administrative tasks than to automate your clicking in Management Studio. So that's kind of the main reason for for using PowerShell and to use DBA tools. Uh, in my day-to-day -day work, I, I don't really know how I did certain things that I now do with DBA tools. Uh, so I'm gonna show you just a little fraction of all the things you can do with DBA tools. And I really encourage you all to, to go and explore yourself. Uh, so let's get started with the with the first demo, and to be honest, this is the last slide. I have a couple more, but I won't actually go back to the slide deck. So this will be an all demo uh, presentation. So I'm switching over to Visual Studio Code. Uh, and before I, I started this presentation, I created a couple of uh, Docker containers with SQL Server. Uh, if you want to look at the scripts that I use, they're all uploaded or they will be all uploaded to, to my GitHub. So github.com slash transmocopter. I will leave a uh, comment in the chat as well when, when I end this so that you can all download the scripts. They're super simple. The only thing that you need to do is create your own Azure storage container and create your own shared access signature key for it. Uh, because using mine would, would be a bad idea. I will remove the, the container when the demo is over. Uh, so I've created two containers. They're called SQL 1 and SQL 2, and they run SQL Server 2019, uh, the Linux version. So let's start with a, a short introduction to, to DBA tools. Uh, first of all, how do you install DBA tools? Well, you open up your PowerShell prompt, I'm currently using, which you can see in the right-hand corner down here, uh, PowerShell 5.1, which is the, the last version of Windows PowerShell that was created. And I would encourage you for the most tasks to actually use uh, PowerShell 7 uh, or 7.1 even, which is PowerShell Core. You can run it on Linux, you can run it on Mac, you can run it on Windows. Uh, there is just one feature which isn't uh, included in DBA tools, or I, I would say in anything that connects to a database. And it's the ability to use aliases. Uh, and uh, for me, when I create my containers, they're kind of mapped to port numbers 1401 and 1402 uh, in my local host. And I, I don't want to have to use like localhost colon 1401 to connect to my containers. So I create aliases for them. And they currently don't work with uh, with PowerShell core. So that's why I'm using 5.1. Uh, I'm gonna create a blog post a little later on uh, with a workaround for it and, and so that you can all use PowerShell core instead. Anyway, the way to install is super simple. You do install module the name of the module, which is DBA tools. 
the repository is kind of optional because it's available from PowerShell Gallery, which is a default repository that you get with the installation of PowerShell. And then I scope it to all users. Uh, and if you want to scope anything to all users, you would have to use an administrative prompt. So either sudo in Linux, I guess, or in Windows, you just do run as administrator. Uh, and then if you use the force flag, you will get the latest version installed, even if you have other versions installed previously. Otherwise, you'll get a prompt and, and the question, do you want to install it, though you have it, etc., etc. Once you have installed DBA tools, the first command inside DBA tools that I'm going to show you is uh, update DBA tools. Uh, and it's kind of funny because then you have the, from the module, you can update the module itself. And the cool thing you can do is uh, if you hit the switch dash development, you will get the development branch from the DBA tools GitHub page or GitHub repository so that you can all contribute and help out with testing new features uh, or just explore new features that are under development. So that's kind of the, the beta, ver beta ver version of uh, DBA tools is hit the dash development switch. Next thing, uh, to be able to connect to my containers, I need uh, credentials. So basically username and password. So I'm gonna start with just uh, running these commands uh, to get some credentials. Because I run my uh, SQL servers in containers on Linux, so I won't be able to use Windows authentication. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, is something that I do with every SQL server instance that I become responsible for. I create my own database on it, uh, my DBA database. And that's where I want to put all my administrative scripts, like the uh, index maintenance solutions from Ola Hallengren and uh, Brent Osar's first responder kit and Adam Mechanics SP who is active, a number of other things. So I'm going to create a new database with the command new DBA database. I'm connecting to SQL instance SQL 1. I'm sending in my credentials that I created a few seconds ago. And the name of the new database is, well, what I stored in the variable db name dba. And I want sa to be the owner of the database. If I don't include owner here, uh, the credential I used to log into SQL Server is going to be the owner of, uh, of the database. So let's go with this. And if everything works, fingers crossed. Yeah, it's it's working, it's connecting. It's a bit slower than usual because of all the streaming of, uh, of video, et cetera, which uses up some resources in my machine. So we'll just have to give it a few seconds. Uh, hopefully not too long. I might have to, yeah, it's not. So the output of this command, this is something that you will see from every command that you that you run in DBA tools. Uh, you get an object back and the object contains everything there is to know about the newly created database. Uh, and this is kind of useful because instead of just outputting to the terminal, you can save it in a variable and you can use it further on in your script. Uh, so that's how most commands in DBA tools works. They will output an object if everything is successful. So then I mentioned Ola Hallegren's maintenance solution for indexes. I mentioned the uh, first responder kit from uh, Brent Osar, and I mentioned Adam Mechanics DB who is active or SP who is active. These are packages that most DBAs in the world use. And the DBAs creating the DBA tools module is no exception to that. So they, of course, included the commands install DBA maintenance solution, install DBA first responder kit, and install DBA who is active. So I'm just going to run these. What they will do is they will go out to a repository on the internet. It will find the latest version of the maintenance solution of the first responder kit and of the uh, SP who is active and install them on the instance and the database that I enter in as parameters. Uh, if you don't have an internet connection from the server that you are installing on, then you 
all you need to have is an internet connection on the machine running the script. So if you run them from your own workstation, connecting to your SQL Server instance, then your workstation will be the, the computer going out on the internet to download the, these packages. Uh, so, and if you need to automate it and you don't really have internet connection at all, uh, you can download and store those packages in a local repository and uh, enter the path of that in the, into the, the commands. So it's possible, but usually you have some machine in your network that has internet connection that you can use to do the installation. So now I've got these perfect scripts, uh, well, good scripts that I use for index maintenance. I think most DBAs in the world use Ola Hallingen's maintenance solutions. That's probably the most used, used open source SQL Server scripts. Next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create a login for me. Uh, and that login is gonna be, uh, let me see, DBA login. Uh, and I have my really, well, not so strong password as a secure string. And the command that I use is new DBA login. So I can run that. And uh, it's gonna, well, obviously create a login for me. Uh, and I get this object back. And after a while, when you write commands, uh, if you have many parameters, it's gonna be a huge line of, of code. And I don't really enjoy looking at one-liners in a script because it, it makes it very unreadable if I have to scroll sideways. So a technique to, to work around that is to use something which is called splatting. And that's basically, you put all the parameters to a command into a hash table like this. And then you just use that hash table as the only parameter to the, to the function that you're running. So we're gonna create another login, my second login, and just run it. This is interesting. Let's see what I did wrong. Let's start with just defining this hash table. It's fun with scripts that stop working. So this works, and new DBA login, login splat. And now it works. So probably I just uh, missed one character or so when I uh, selected code. So these two using a splat or just entering the parameters on the line of code, they're equivalent, but I find splatting to be make your code much more readable. Let's move on to something more interesting. Magnus, uh, uh, is it possible you can go ahead and increase the font size? Absolutely. Is that better? Much better. Perfect. So uh, a common task if you're a DBA is to back up your databases. Uh, and when I created this, uh, this presentation initially, it was after having uh, done some migration work. So we migrated basically a whole infrastructure from on-premise data center to Azure. Uh, and for the databases, we couldn't really have any downtime for them. So we, well, a minute maximum. So we, we did a migration of uh, databases using log shipping. Uh, and if you ever worked with log shipping, you, you would know that the built-in log shipping functionality requires a shared folder so basically a unc path uh, to store the uh, transaction logs copy them over to the secondary and then restore them there uh, we were not allowed to to use a shared path that we could access from both the machine in the data center and the azure machine so we had to build our own log shipping uh, and store the backups in an uh, azure storage container uh, so I'm going to show you, we'll see how far we get to this presentation because it's really a 60 minute presentation, but uh, I'm trying to condense it as much as possible so we get to the actual log shipping solution. But it, it of course starts with being able to back up your databases to an Azure storage container. Uh, so 
I'm first going to just create the credentials from this script too. And then I define some more parameters. The URL to my blob storage container, which I've set up prior to this. Uh, and then to be able to use a storage container to do backup to URL in the SQL Server, you need to define a credential object in SQL Server. And that credential object has a shared access signature as its kind of password. Uh, so to generate one of those, you go into either the Azure portal or you use the, the PowerShell commandlets to, to handle your Azure infrastructure. But it's really simple to do in the Azure portal. So you go into your storage uh, uh, storage container and you create a shared access signature for it. And then I use that as kind of a password in my code here. You should never hard code passwords like this, but this is a demo. But in the real scenario, of course, you would store uh, these kind of secrets in uh, in some kind of key store. Uh, so that's the secret. And then we convert it to a secure string. And then we can go ahead and create the credential objects in a SQL Server using DBA tools commands new DBA credential. Uh, and I'm going to do that on both my my instances, SQL 1 and SQL 2, uh, because I'm going to use SQL 2 as my secondary in kind of a log shipping solution. So SQL 1 is where I have all my databases, and I'm going to do log shipping to SQL 2 uh, by the end of this. So let's run all this code. And what it will give me is two new uh, credential objects, one in SQL 1 and one in SQL 2. Uh, and when I have this, I can do backup to URL from SQL Server uh, without entering the password because it's securely stored and encrypted inside a SQL Server master database now. Uh, we could do this to both instances at once, instead of having two lines of code, we can do it with just one line of code and just enter SQL 1 comma SQL 2 uh, as the instances to the command. So this SQL instance parameter is really a string array rather than a, a string. So let's run this. Uh, I'm forcing the creation by using the force flag, so that will uh, drop and recreate those credential objects. And this is one of the situations where you have basically too much to fit on one screen, so I have to scroll sideways. So again, use a splat, uh, just a hash table to enter the parameters, and then use this splat as, uh, as as the parameter to the function. And here you can see that you, you can enter a splat for kind of a set of default uh, uh, parameters. And then if you need a, a specialized parameter for one certain task, then you can enter that too on the command line. Fits. So this is a combination of named parameters and a splat. So it will give us the same result. Cool. So now that we have our credentials created and we have our DBA database created with some new objects installed in the DBA database, namely the maintenance solution, etc., we can go ahead and run backup DBA database. So if I run backup DBA database, I enter my instance and my credentials, name of the database, uh, and then the Azure base URL. Uh, and by entering information on the Azure base URL, this command knows that it's going to convert to a backup to URL command for SQL Server. And my type of backup is a full backup. So let's run these. And let's hope they don't take forever. I don't think they will. Uh, and while it's running, I'm going to switch over to showing how it looks inside the container. So let's go to 
here and reload the page. So the backup command is still running, but we see that we have a new file in here. And perhaps I should do some zooming. That's 300%. That's maybe too much. <laughs> 200 will probably be good. So you see we get in the root folder of my container, I have a backup file, which is named dba underscore, and then the date and hour and minute, etc and .bak. So that's the default naming convention, uh, database name underscore uh, timestamp for the backup. So let's switch back to VS Code. Uh, the backup command is done. You probably don't want to store all your backups in the root folder. So what you can do is you define a variable with kind of your, uh, the pattern for your uh, where you want to store it. So we have to begin with the URL to my container. And then I have server name slash instance name, backup type and DB name. And then to the command backup DBA database, you enter uh, the switch replace in name, which will replace these ones with the actual database name. This one with the actual backup type, etc. Uh, so if I run these now, we will get the backup stored in a nice folder structure inside the storage container. So moving back to Edge, and if I just do a reload of this one, you will see that we have the instance name or the server name and then the instance name and then full backups for the database DBA. So very simple. And let's switch back to Visual Studio Code. One thing you probably want to think about is uh, when you get this uh, database backup created, the default is that the timestamp format is year, month, day, hour, and minute. But if you do transaction log backups on a really busy system, you might want to do the backups more than once per minute. So then you have to enter the switch timestamp format, where you basically add the seconds to the pattern of the timestamp. And that way you can do a, a transaction log backup every second and still get a unique name for it. And I don't think you will run backups more often than that. Uh, so just running that, well, I'm gonna skip actually running it uh, and move further. Next thing that I'm gonna do is to restore a database. So inside my storage container, I have stored a uh, backup of the AdventureWorks 2014 database. So I'm just going to go ahead and restore it using the restore DBA database command. Uh, and then when I'm done with it, I'm going to set the recovery model to full. Because in the backup file, it's a backup of a database with simple recovery model. So this might take a little while. So while it's running, I'm gonna head over to Management Studio just to show you that we have uh, our instance. We've got our databases created and it's loading. So we have the DBA database. And as you can see, we have the AdventureWorks 2014 database, which is restoring. So. No fancy business. So this is a Linux SQL Server container, uh, which I can access just as I'm used to with Management Studio. Uh, so we have some progress on the restore database command. It's a bit slow because of my network connection, but uh, I'm just gonna leave it to finish and talk you through the, the next steps of the code. Uh, what I'm going to do is create 
two jobs. So that's the next thing, new DBA agent job. That will create SQL Server agent jobs for you. Uh, and I'm going to create one that I name full backup and one for log backups. And then I'm going to create some job steps for them. So uh, the first job step is uh, going to run this command, which is using Ola Hallengren's maintenance solution, but it's using the, uh, uh, the backup database command. Uh, so I'm going to back up to URL and I'm going to do full backups. And then I have a job step, which is very similar, but does a log backup. So when I have the jobs created, I create uh, job steps with new DBA agent job step, and then I create schedules for them. And I have the same splat here for both the full backup schedule and the log backup schedule. But for the full backup schedule, I have the frequency subday type hours. So basically once per hour, I'm going to run a full backup. And for the log backup, I'm going to do it once per minute. And then finally, I'm going to start a uh, the full backup jobs just so we get new full backups in our storage container. So let's select all of this and just run it. How are we on time? We have basically 15 minutes to go, right? And I hope I am still online. Simon. Yeah, I think you still have 20 minutes. OK, perfect. Thank you. So uh, while this is running, uh, we're going to head over to the real fun stuff, which is the uh, migration scenario that actually DBA tools was initially created uh, for migrating uh, database instances or upgrading by migration. Uh, so this is going to create our jobs and we're going to move on over here to look at some migration scenarios and hopefully we will end up actually implementing a full log shipping solution for a database. Uh, so one of the most powerful commands in DBA tools is start DBA migration. Uh, and as soon as the job uh, creations are done down here, uh, I'm going to show you what this command will do. And I'm going to show that by um, uh, using the what if switch. And the what if switch is implemented for every command uh, that would potentially change anything. So start TBA migration definitely would change something. Uh, it would migrate uh, all the objects from one server to another. But anything else, any set command, uh, implements the what if switch by using uh, uh, commandlet bindings on the, on the functions in PowerShell. Uh, and that's kind of powerful and, and useful because if you don't really know what the command does, you can try it, see if it has the what if switch, that should be safe to run and it will just output what would the script do, uh, not actually perform those actions. So, Let's see what the start DBA migration actually does. And it, it's going to fill the screens with information about steps that are included in this uh, really powerful command, start DBA migration. And when you do your own migrations, if, if you need to do an upgrade or just move instances between servers, uh, maybe you could use start DBA migration. But if you don't actually use that command, it's super useful to run it with a what if switch and you will get a list of things that you really should consider uh, when you're in a migration scenario. Uh, so you see it's starting to, to output. These are steps that the command would do if I would have omitted the what if switch. So just take the output of this, look it through and see for every line inside here, you should take uh, a decision. Do I need to care about this or not? 
because some of them you don't need to care about. For example, containment. Do, if you don't have um, uh, contained databases in your instances, well, you don't need to bother, but you need to at least take a decision. Do I need to care about this or not? So I'm actually gonna stop that command uh, because it's really slow today. And uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, the devil is in the demos, as they say. So let's kill my PowerShell session and start a new one. Four times. Uh, so I'm gonna go up here and reinitialize my credentials as soon as my PowerShell terminal fires up. I'm kind of giving Visual Studio Code a bad reputation by it being a bit slow, but it's it's always when you do streaming of your own video, you get kind of half the resources of your computer and the rest goes to the streaming. So that, that's the reason why it's uh, slowish. By the way, if you haven't started using Visual Studio Code for PowerShell, uh, do that because as soon as you write a script that you will use for any production uh, scenario, you really should <clears throat> should maintain that code. I mean, you you become a developer as soon as you write code, and this is code, even though it's for administrative purposes, it's still code. So you should uh, keep it under version control, etc. And Visual Studio Code will help you enormously with that, with the built-in. Uh, git functionality for example so i got my terminal back uh, and i'm going to skip the full migration because it will just be it will take too long and instead i'm going to do a couple of migration steps i'm going to copy the logins from one instance to another and then i'm going to copy the sql server agent jobs uh, and when i copy the sql server agent jobs with copy dba agent job this is really useful switches that you have. You have a disable on destination or disable on source. Uh, and that's super useful for immigration because when you migrate jobs to a secondary, you probably do it in advance before you actually do a failover. Uh, so then you would want to have them disabled on the secondary until you do the failover and then you can enable them. Uh, so that's what this will do. And the copy DBA login, it's kind of self-explanatory what it will do. So let's run this. Uh, and you will see with the copy DBA login, it's uh, one of many commands in, uh, in DBA tools which are idempotent. What does that mean? Well, that means you can run them over and over again and they won't break just because you already did copy the logins. So you will see in the output that some of the logins will be copied and some of the logins were already copied before. So they will be skipped. If I can just get uh, a nice output here. It's really fun to watch my terminal not responding, right? Uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to leave this and talk you through the rest of the code for the actual log shipping scenario. Uh, we'll see that this finishes eventually. So. Uh, for my kind of home cooked log shipping scenario, what I've done is uh, I've created a database where I store some metadata about the log shipping. Uh, and that basically contains one table, log shipping watermarks, where I have the name of the database that I'm that is included in my log shipping. Uh, it has a, a path to the last full backup that I restored. And that's not actually used by the by the log shipping, but it's just for me to be able to know which was the last full backup that I restored. And then I'm storing the last log sequence number. So that's kind of the 
the last uh, transaction from the transaction log backup that I last restored. And that's to know uh, which transaction log backups have I already applied and which haven't I applied. And then I'm, uh, I'm initializing by inserting one row into the log shipping watermarks, which will be the, uh, the row for the DBA database, which is the one I'm going to start my log shipping for. And then I use invoke DBA query to run my SQL commands against an instance. And it's going to finish soon. The next step I do is I get the uh, using the get DBA DB backup history with a switch last full. I get the last full backup, uh, the path to the last full backup that I performed for my database DBA on my instance SQL 1. Uh, and we can output that to the screen, to the terminal. And then I'm going to do a restore DBA database on my SQL instance SQL 2 with the no recovery switch. Using the no recovery switch, I'm not taking the database online. Uh, I am just um, uh, restoring it, but not doing the actual recovery phase. And therefore, I can apply more transaction log backups afterwards. So let's run these two. And this is the manual steps uh, included in any log shipping scenario. You need to do a restore of a full backup from your primary to your secondary instance. Uh, so the restore is currently running. You see here that we have the path to the last full backup that was created. Uh, and when the restore is done, I'm going to update my uh, log shipping watermarks table with the path to my last full backup. So basically the backup path. Uh, and I'm going to insert that using invoke DBA query. And then I start the log shipping sequence, which will... Uh, Go to the watermarks table, uh, look up the last restored LSN, the last LSN column, and then use that uh, to do it for each. It gets the uh, backup history from my primary instance uh, with the type log. So basically all the transaction log backups, uh, which have a log sequence number, which is higher than the last restored log sequence number on my secondary. And then I do some sorting, sort object by the property start. Uh, and that's so that I get the transaction log backups in the right sequence. Uh, otherwise, my restores will fail. Uh, and then I convert the last log sequence number to a int64, which is the equivalent of a big int in SQL Server. Uh, I do a restore of the transaction log backups on my secondary with the no recovery switch again, because I want to be able to restore even more backups later on. And the continue switch, which tells the command that uh, this is a, uh, I'm continuing a restore. So basically I'm expecting that the database is in no recovery mode and I'm going to restore a, a transaction log backup on top of that. And then finally, I do an update of my table log shipping watermarks to insert the log sequence number of the transactional backup that I just restored. Let's get this started uh, and see what it does for us. It's going to go to instance. Not going to do anything because I need to insert this. Skip the step. Uh, 
let's see if I can make it actually do it. Now it's starting to work. So just repetition, I'm finding the last log sequence number uh, of a transaction log backup. I'm restoring it. I'm getting the next transaction log backup from the history on my primary, restoring it to my secondary. And this is going to loop until it, uh, it's finished with all the transaction log backups that it finds in the history. And if you remember, some minutes ago, I created a SQL Server agent job, which runs uh, transaction log backups every minute. So there is going to be a few of those. And then in the end, we're just going to look at the contents of log shipping watermarks. Uh, so that actually concludes. We're, we're going to let this finish and then look at uh, my instance SQL 2 in Management Studio. We could actually start doing that uh, already now. So let's head over to Management Studio. We're going to connect to my instance SQL 2 while the PowerShell script is finishing up. So SQL 2. There we go. Object Explorer. And it's a bit slow as well to load. So let's have some patience. Oh, this is all very fun to watch. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so as you can see, soonish, we will have a database DBA, uh, which is in restoring mode. The log, log shipping metadata that I created, I chose to create that on my instance SQL 2. Uh, it doesn't really make a big difference if I create it on this uh, or if I create it somewhere else. Uh, as long as I have a database which I can reach from the scripts, the, uh, the log shipping scripts. It can be anywhere. It can be an Azure SQL database. It can be a database on your own uh, infrastructure. But the interesting part is the DBA re uh, database, which it will be in restoring mode until we manually takes it online. But so that's the last steps of my uh, on my presentation. I'm going to switch back to PowerShell code, uh, Visual Studio code, and see that the PowerShell scripts are finishing up. Let's leave them at that. And uh, the conclusion is, in 45 minutes, I have created two SQL Server instances. I have created a DBA database. I have restored the AdventureWorks database. I have set up my full backups and my transaction log backups. And I have implemented a log shipping between one instance and the other, which is currently running. So doing this in Management Studio, I don't honestly think that it would have been done in just 45 minutes. And talking you through it while it's running. And now, as you can see, the, the first loop of the log, uh, log shipping is done. So that's all I had, actually. So thank you so much for having me on.